Thank you for the introduction. Let's see. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about driving in-source sales with real-time personalization. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Catalina, we are a personalized digital media company. And we work with consumer packaged goods, brands, and retailers to drive volume and ROI. And we can contact shoppers through our in-store network and online. But really, at the heart of it, we're a big data company. We have almost half a million checkout lanes where we can collect point of sales data. And we see about 2 billion transactions on a given day. And we have access to 300 million unique shoppers. So one of the problems that we're helping our retailer partners solve is with their circulars. So a circular is that newspaper that you see at a grocery store or drug store that has the promotions and advertisements for a week. And in each, the, each of these circulars, there's hundreds of products that are put on promotion. And millions of dollars are spent every week producing these circulars. However, the average shopper only buys a handful of the items in this circular on a given week. In fact, they buy less than 1% of the items on, on promotion. So retailers need a better way to surface the most relevant content to their shoppers. One of the ways that Catalina is helping with that is a product called My Favorite Deals. So My Favorite Deals is a personalized circular which surfaces the most relevant deals based on an individual shopper's behavior. Really what this is is a recommender system for uh, printed content. And it's truly one-to-one -one communication. So we see that every shopper is unique, so they get a unique set of deals that's most relevant to them. And we deliver this subset of promotions and advertisements through our in-store network, through email, and online, through mobile devices and websites. One of the reasons that I like talking about this product in particular so much is the results that we've seen. So we've had proven incremental sales sustained over long periods of time that's helped our uh, retailer partners generate more revenue. And we've gotten great feedback from their customers as well, providing this, this uh, personalized experience. In order to deliver this personalized experience, um, we need to be able to do this in real time. So generate these recommendations as we see millions and millions of, of shoppers and have hundreds of, of promotions that we need to score on a weekly basis. So when, when we think about this from a data science perspective and how we want to execute this type of real-time personalization, the, the key goal for, for the data science team is to have hands-off execution. And what I mean by that is that we don't want to be shepherding the, these processes and, and pushing buttons. We want it to kind of happen in the background after we've built our models, and these programs can just execute. So we wanted to be spending more time doing the actual analy analysis and high-value data science work, and less time implementation and with execution. So there's three things that I wanted to touch on today that have helped us with this real-time personalization that's powering products like My Favorite Deals, um, among, among other uh, solutions that Catalina has. So the first thing is our aggregation API, or aggregation microservice, which creates the variables and transforms our semi-structured data that we can use as inputs into our model. Next, we leverage H2O, and in particular, the POJO output, so that we can score our models in real time. And finally, we have a set of monitoring set up so that we can uh, kind of keep a pulse on what's happening as data is moving across these different services. So first, this aggregation API. The goal here is to replicate the features that we build offline when we're training our models based on data in our data warehouse, and, and replicate those in our real-time execution environment. Um, and, and Karthik actually touched on this a little bit too, how important it is that your data that you're, building, you're using to train your models is, matches the same type of data that you're going to be executing against, so you can get consistent results from your models in, in, in your execution platform or, or production platform. And so this might seem uh, obvious or trivial that you want these two things to match, 
But what we found is the data in our execution environment is sometimes structured slightly differently than the data that we get from our data warehouse. So this, this service or API is, is set up in a way so that we can replicate that. And there's really two components to this, uh, to this aggregation service. So the, the first thing is we want to be able to define some dimensions and then metrics or calculations that we want to roll up. And what I mean by that is we have a few high-level uh, dimension definitions like category or brand or location that we can use. And then we've defined our set of uh, calculations that we want to build. And from that, we can generate hundreds of thousands of individual variables that we can use for our modeling. Uh, and this is great because we, can, we have a lot of flexibility with the, with the types of variables we can use. And this service is set up in a way so this is also executing in real time. Since we have so many shoppers and so many potential variables and we're getting data on a daily basis, we don't want to have to pre-calculate all the different variations of potential variables. So we just uh, calculate them on demand using this service. The other component to this is some data, data preparation. So the data that we use uh, for our execution is stored in a DMP or data management platform, which is semi-structured and contains transaction level data. Um, but we want to make sure that we're handling any uh, data anomalies or missing values uh, appropriately, and also normalizing the data so that it matches the same type of uh, you know, transformation processes that might happen in our data warehouse through you know, traditional ETL. So once we've, once we've defined our set of input variables um, and you know, they're ready to be put into the, into the model, the next thing we want to do is actually score the the uh, offers that we have available for individual shoppers. And the way that we're doing that is by leveraging H2O and, in particular, the, uh, the POJO. So the POJO is this uh, plain old Java object that you can export after you've built your model, whether it's in Python or R or even directly through the UI. And we've built our execution platform so that we can upload these POJOs directly into uh, the system. This is great from a data science perspective because it means that we don't actually have to do any ongoing development work when we want to put a new model into production or potentially change an existing model. Not to say that there wasn't some de development work that needed to be done um, in order to build this, and you know, we've got a great development team who uh, you know, facilitated this so that now we can just drop these, these models into the system. But at this point, it's uh, much more of a plug-and-play solution versus a, a custom coding every time we want to create a new model. The other huge benefit from a data science perspective is we don't need to do any model translation. And what I mean by that is prior to using H2O, we had to uh, you know, we, we build our model in our analytical environment, and in, in again, in R, Python, or even SAS. And then we would have to create a, a technical document, which our development team would take, and then uh, execute that into our ex execution platform. So they're, they're essentially rewriting the code that we had produced um, based on you know, our, our best model. And then you know, the data science team needs to kind of oversee that process and then do a lot of testing and QA to make sure um, that that model matches exactly what, what we defined in, in our analytical environment. So now we don't have to do that because we can simply, uh, you know, drop in this, this H2O POJO into our, into our platform. The last thing that this gives us is some more flexibility in terms of the model. So, um, it's now just as easy to implement a, a more complex model like a random forest or GBM as it is to do a simple you know, linear re regression or logistic model. Um, because again, we don't, have to, we don't have to translate the variables and, and the way um, that, that the model's working under the hood. All we need to do is, is simply drop in this POJO. 
So now we've gone from you know, taking our, our DMP data, building our aggregates, and we can score um, you know, hundreds of, of uh, offers for an individual shopper and, and deliver them through uh, in-store and, and online. And we've done this in, in a low-touch environment where uh, once we've built the, the pipeline, there's no real involvement from the data science team in order to execute this, this project. Um, so this, this low-touch environment is great because it's scalable and it's more efficient. But one of the problems when you move into a low-touch environment is you no longer have eyes on data as it's moving from one place to another. So you want to have some kind of uh, you know, gut checks and um, you know, way to ensure that the calculations that you're making and as data is moving through this pipeline, that everything's working as expected. So we've set up a, a set of monitoring that will help us kind of keep our eyes on, on this pipeline without actually having to touch anything. And so when I talk about monitoring in this sense, I'm not really talking about traditional monitoring, like making sure that server response times are uh, you know, low and you know, there's data and moves from point A to point B, but really more of uh, kind of what I think of as like math monitoring. So looking at the data input and output values and um, you know, checking to see if they meet our expectations. Let me give you an example. Of, of one of the things that we look at. So a particular variable for one of our models might be total sales within a category. So you know, we're trying to predict which, which types of uh, products or offers are um, you know, most relevant for an individual shopper. So we want to see what their spend is in a particular um, you know, CPG category. Now, when we build our models, we might see that the value for total spend in this category is between 0 and 500. Now, when we set up this monitoring, we'll put these kind of guardrails in place. And if we start seeing, let's say, negative values come in to our system, we'll set up an alert that will tell us, OK, the data is not what we expected. And then that way, we can go and start to investigate. So in this case, maybe the um, POS data or point of sale data that we're collecting started uh, using coupons or, or refunds were, were getting uh, added into that data source. So this allows us to identify that something has changed and it also helps keep our models um, it, uh, keep our models accurate because if you start having data that looks different than when you trained your models, um, you know that's going to that's going to lower the accuracy and you know, lead to, to worse predictions than when you started. So this is a way for us to kind of keep a pulse on this data pipeline without actually having to be as hands-on. So just to recap the, uh, the, the three things that we've learned from doing real-time personalization to power products like My Favorite Deals. First is to use this aggregation API, which can create scalable features that matches our training data. Next is to leverage the H2O POJO so that we can do faster implementation. And finally is our uh, math monitoring so that we can quickly identify issues. And that's all I've got. Uh, I know we're, we're trying to keep the questions down, so I'll be around afterward if uh, anyone's got any questions. Thank you.